I'm really interested, and I have been interested for a long time, in what the founders in the 18th, even the 17th century colonial people living in the United States, what was to become the United States, but especially the founders and, and uh, Americans living in the early 19th century, what they took away from the classical rhetorical tradition. That was the beginnings of my interest in what people like John Quincy Adams and earlier, like Thomas Jefferson, and even earlier than that. Um, I was fascinated by the way they looked to Greece and Rome and a very small canon of Greek and Roman texts from models of how to talk as citizens in this place where there was at least the promise of a really of, of a truly egalitarian and democratic society that in some of its elements and I don't want to paint you know the 18th century as a utopia but um, but when they were seeking practical ways or practical models of how people can talk to each other that's where they looked so that's why of course as Jim Tatum and Bill Cook and others have written about so so persuasively and eloquently, um, that's why African Americans and Native Americans through the 19th century fought so hard to gain access to classical learning, not just because it was social capital and because they could claim, you know, they'd read the same books as the white elites, but because they could see the, the, the skills and, um, and models that, that white elites were, were learning. From a writer like Cicero or Quintilian, so so that's where I started. You know, in in uh, in this combination of very idealistic but also very practical investment in what the classical world had to offer modernity as they understood it in the 18th century. Um, but then over time, I got more interested in, and this is what I've been working on more recently, in um, in the radical side of of the classical legacy, to use a phrase that I usually use. Um, but it stands for everything, Greek and Roman. But it's tied to what I'm working on now, which is the, um, the radical appeal that especially Roman moral heroes held for revolutionaries in the 18th century in France and America, and especially in, in America. Because that, I think, helps us understand the role of radical thinking in the 18th century, which is a history that's been repressed uh, from our very clean and idealistic picture of the founders wanting to set up the city on, on a hill. I mean, it was, it was a violent war of independence, and it, it involved a social, economic, political shakeup, um, and it involved uh, bringing together people who wouldn't have necessarily thought of themselves as, a, as bonded in any way. And, Part of that bonding glue was aspirational ideals, but part of the bonding glue was we're going to fight together and we're going to kill people together and, um, and we're going to sacrifice ourselves. So that last little strand um, is, is, I found, really interesting in the last couple of years because, you know, tragically, uh, all over the world these days, we're seeing people willing to sacrifice themselves for what they believe in, religious ideals, political ideals. Um, and. You know, there's there's uh, no tradition of suicide bombing in uh, in the 18th century, but but the seeds for radical activity through the through the 19th century are are planted in in the fighting and struggles that went on in the 18th century. So I thought this was one way to to rethink the impact that the classical world had on that on that period to look at the power of these extreme examples that the Romans provide of ultimate willingness to, to sacrifice oneself and to do violence in the name of an idea. I think, and at a time of social fragmentation and change, which was very much the case, massive amounts of immigration and, and social flux that people like Gordon Wood at Brown have written about in the American 18th century context, you know, we're in, obviously, a million differences, but we're in an analogous situation these days with uh, the traditional ways of working and labor changing, um, the need for education growing, our educational system not keeping up, uh, globalization, I mean, I don't need to go through the list and describing how the world is changing today, but in that kind of situation, the need and the, well, on the one hand, the, the perception that we need a common language to be able to talk to each other across these fragmenting forces, but then on the other and, and more troubling side, the desire for certainty that I think many many of us feel that I certainly have feel uh, 
as we're trying to chart a path through a world of intense ambivalence and ambiguity. So it's a, another moment to think about what um, what the the power of clear moral models that are extreme and way out there, you know, what they can do to us.